Hello and welcome to Center Ice Card Cast, your one-stop podcast shop for all things hockey cards. My name is Eric Andrews, also known in the hobby as Hammerhawks, and I'm joined by my co-host and fellow hobbyist Aaron Goldstein, better known as Crease Collector. So really quick to start off the episode, I just wanted to share about a huge assist that I got from one of our listeners recently in order to acquire a super rare card from my Nicholas Jalmerson collection. And uh, that being a 2019-20 Upper Deck Chronology Time Capsules Mini Canvas Blank Back numbered out of three. And it's actually the first copy of the card I have seen to date. And it was posted on by a collector on Instagram. And fortunately enough, one of our listeners, Luke, uh, LP Graphs on Instagram, alerted me to it pretty much immediately. And to give another little shout out and honorable mention to another listener of ours, PDX Hockey Cards on Instagram also tagged me on it shortly after. And uh, thanks to that, those tags, I was able to work out a deal pretty quickly and the card is en route uh, today. So uh, super excited to get that card. I it was starting to feel like I might never see a copy of that card. So the fact that a listener was able to help me find it and acquire it was, was really awesome. And then for the main part of the show, joining us is Stephen LaRush, someone who has some pretty cool insight about the hobby from a number of different angles. And I was really excited when Aaron told me earlier this week that you guys had been in contact and that you wanted to come on the show. As I've heard Stephen, you know, share about his time in the hobby quite a few times previously. So, you know, just hearing that he wanted to come hang out with us was, was pretty exciting. So with that, Stephen, thank you so much for coming on. We're really excited to have you. Thanks, guys. Uh, Eric I, I, and Aaron, you guys are doing some amazing work right now, um, you know, and really doing a great job in promoting the hobby and getting stories out there, which I think is one of the most important things that um, that sometimes gets lost over time. It's, uh, you know, the, the hobby historian, they're, they're few and far between. And uh, I think I think it's time for us to start keeping track of things. And you guys have this audio archive now that's going to stick around forever. It's fantastic. Oh, thank you. Appreciate that. Yeah. Um, just to start off, we've done this uh, a couple times now with some episodes and it seems like people like it. So we'll do it with you as well. Um, just kind of a quick little lightning round to get to know you a little bit personally outside of the hobby. So first question, what is your favorite snack? My favorite snack? Ah, man. Um, I eat too much. That's, that's, part of my problem uh, you know when you eat your feelings <laughs> right uh, the uh, if I were to pick one thing it's gonna sound so boring oatmeal raisin cookie like a fresh one not I, not a pre-packaged piece of crap that's dry dry no dad's no, no. cookies oh no 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 not I, are they I better now disagree. I had some yesterday and they were great so I'm gonna have to you know agree to disagree with you on that one well, you know Dad's what? Dad's prepackaged. They're good. They're okay. Good. You know what? I will make an effort to go out and try them again because I just remember Dad's cookies from when I was a kid, and they were just like the worst. <laughs> so, I mean, like, I'm sure they've gotten a little bit better. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> give it a go. That if you can take that from this podcast today, I'll be very happy. All I right. Think Dad's cookies have made an improvement, but as far as your favorite beverage goes, to wash uh -huh. down those terrible Dad's cookies. How, how would that go? Favorite Ooh, beverage. Favorite beverage. Um, these days, it's like Coke Zero or Pepsi Max, honestly. Um, you know, and it's probably still not good for me because of, you know, the aspartame content. Um, but you know what? A, a nice, <laughs> again, this is going to sound so boring. A nice cold glass of water on a hot day, it, it's like perfection. So there, you, there we go. <laughs> exactly. You got my yeah. water here right now. So I feel that. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, it's kind of interesting because we asked this question to other people, you know, being card collectors and you've been a card collector, but you're kind of getting out of the hobby a little bit, which we will talk about later. But mm -hmm. if you had to collect something at this point, other than cards, whether that be hobby related or something just completely different, what would that be? Oh, wow. Okay. Um, there's a few hobby treasures I'm trying to track down that are, that are not necessarily card related or sports related. For some reason, in the past year, I lost, I had a cut signature of uh, singer Harry Nelson, um, who, you know, you'd know from like Coconut, Without You, and all that sort of thing. Um, but I, I related to him on, on a certain level after watching this do fantastic documentary about him. Um, so I need to find an, a, um, a Harry Nelson cut signature again. But I also need a John McVie from Fleetwood Mac, the bass player, his 
signature because I all the other uh, the classic rumors line up except for him <laughs> and I don't want to pay two hundred dollars on eBay because it's not worth two hundred dollars like it's just not <laughs> so um but other than that I um I like it I like collecting original art now um you know it doesn't have to be you know famous artist or anything like that it's just I like what I like um you know I've got uh, you know uh, an artist out of out of Cambridge that's done a couple things for my wife and I. Just uh, she did like an R two D two, which I thought was fantastic. She did Maleficent from from Disney for for her and um, Mike James, who uh, you know did art for in, in the game and uh, is done for like um, maybe Rittenhouse, definitely uh, Cryptozoic. Um, I have a painting he did of the um, Gordy Howe rookie card, which I need to get framed up and and all that. And my daughter, who's an amazing artist and yet doesn't do art anymore. Um, she's 18. She's got a, other pursuits going on. Uh, she did a rendition of the 5455 Topps Gordy Howe, which in my opinion is the most beautiful hockey card ever made. And to me, that that painting means so much to me. It, 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 so to me, it's it's like, I love art. I, um, you know, but I'm thinking about collecting maybe a little music memorabilia in there. I, I and um, I need to get that Lego Star Wars Cantina set. That's impossible to get right now because it's got my favorite Star Wars character in it. For the first time, they made a Lego of Walrus Man. So, <laughs> you know, I gotta have it. You know, but <laughs> it's it is what it is. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like all that stuff. Like when you take a look at like just the magnitude of hobbies in, in the world it kind of it sucks because like you can get pulled in so many different directions and mm. it's like man there's only like there's only so much space you know in my place there's, there's only so much money in my in my wallet but i mean you know it's kind of nice that you can kind of narrow down the things you do love and hopefully capitalize on those things now that was all the the friendly questions i guess we should say but um and now we'll get into some i, I guess hot takes but if you were to choose one hobby hot take, maybe right now, um, what would that be? My hot take is, why are people so crazy over retail all of a sudden? <laughs> <laughs> well, Target yeah, I, stopped selling. Oh, well, uh, they Target did. Walmart stopped selling yeah. that because they were afraid of all the in-person stuff that was going on. Mm -hmm. I think somewhere in the States, like there was a, a like a knife or a gun or something like that, like That's over, crazy. you know, uh, Target retail product, product. So yeah. uh, unreal. Well, and, and to me, it, the thing is, is, you know, for, for years, retail was the redhead stepchild. And I hope I'm not offending any redheads or stepchildren out there. <laughs> but um, the, the, the thing is, is that, you know, for, for introductory level collectors, it was fantastic. You know, you got, you got a taste of, you know, potentially pulling something nice. Like you bought a, an Upper Deck Series 1 blaster and hey, oh, wow, I got a McDavid Young Guns. Like that, that's you know, a, a fantastic experience. That's a great introduction to the hobby. Um, but I mean, it's it's history repeating itself in a way too, because in, in I, and I draw a comparison of my attitude towards, uh, you know, the the hobby mania that we're having today to, towards um, a guy named Andrew Powerchuk, who um, he was the guy who in the, in the 1980s um, and in, in the 70s to a certain degree too, he was a, a collector and dealer that um, that advertised in the hockey news, but he also did an annual price guide, um, and it was kind of the first mass market hockey card price guide out there. Um, and he he actually passed away a year or two ago, um, but he circa 1990 got very disenchanted with the hobby because of all the, the changes that happened. Well, we've got all these new manufacturers, we've got this, we've got that, and now it's it's like I see a, a parallel in my own life where I'm thinking. Well, I'm feeling a little disenchanted because X, Y, Z. And, you know, it, it's not that I don't love the, the hobby. I, I'm always going to love the hobby, but it's it's just, you know, it, it's, it's a little hard for me today. Like, and I, and I, and I totally get where Andrew was coming from. Because I, I, I did a, an interview with him once, and he would only do it over email <laughs> for, for a Beckett story. Um, because he, he, he kind of, I think he would just wanted to control his aunt, his responses to the questions and that sort of thing. And I, 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 can, I can respect that. I, I can build, I built a story around it. It, was, it wasn't that hard to, to ultimately do, but I could tell there was a certain bitterness on his end. And I'm hoping not to end up bitter, but I'm definitely a little, it, it's hard, for, a little hard for me right now at times. 
I was going to say like, um, and we might get into this later, but I mean, your experience um, in the hobby as a whole, but also just working and having your livelihood tied up mm. in the ho- in the hobby as well. Like that is very hard to not, like on the good days, it's great. Like, mm. don't get me wrong. And it probably sends your hobby experience like through the roof. But on those bad days, unfortunately, it, it, it can be hard to truly un- unwind with a hobby when your day-to-day life is, is wrapped up in it. You know, how do you mm-hmm. truly enjoy it after yeah. a bad day at work kind of thing? So, I mean, it's, <laughs> it's difficult. It's, it's, it's not an easy question. I'm sure there's like ebbs and flows for sure, but it's, mm-hmm. it would be very difficult, I'm sure. Well, it, it, when, you, when you work in the hobby, um, you know, it's, you know, in my experience anyway, um, most of my hobby work has been from home. Um, you know, on one hand, I got to ra- raise raise Gwen. I got to, um, you know, be here if, if there was an emergency, anything like that. But at the same time, it was like I could never just shut it, shut it off. I mean, there were nights where it'd be 1030 at night and a story would drop all of a sudden and, and I'd just go right right to the right to the keyboard and, and start pounding away. Um, I, I remember getting an email from Brian Price on Boxing Day <laughs> or Christmas Day. It was, and it was just like, I, I knew he was just sending it. So I think I'd see it later, but it was just like, oh, wow. Like, I, 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 like why am I checking it today? <laughs> Yeah, don't check your emails. Don't, like, yeah. as soon as work's done, work's done. But yeah, I yeah. Agree. it's hard sometimes. Yeah. So that was a lesson, I think, that once I stopped, once the, the term with Beckett ended, um, I was able to start, you know, like relearning how to be in a, in a home situation, in a sense, because everything had changed. And it wasn't easy, but you know, I, I think I'm at, at a be- much better point now in, um, in, ba- in, in achieving work-life balance. That's good. That's good. Yeah. So you kind of referenced a couple things there, but for any listeners who might not be familiar with you, can you just share a little bit about yourself and your background with the hobby, including some of those various stops that you've had along the way? Oh, absolutely. It's, this, this is probably going to take a while. <laughs> so, uh, you know, just smile and nod, uh, you know, along the way or interject if you need to. Um, so I started collecting in 1981, um, late 1981. Uh, I had, uh, was in kindergarten at the time and uh, opened up a box of alphabets and a um, pop-up uh, of Morris Lukowicz of the Winnipeg Jets uh, came out of uh, out in the package and I open it up and there he is, you know, you could assemble it. And that was my first introduction to a collectible. Um, so quickly after um, I, I was get got involved with the uh, 8182 Apache hockey stickers in the albums, um, which was actually a test issue in Ontario and Quebec, or it's believed to be. Um, so I was lucky in that regard. I grew up in uh, Trenton, Ontario. And so within a few months, I, reluctantly went into into hockey cards because I love the sticker so much I wasn't quite ready to transition into cards and once I opened that first pack and I've, I've narrowed down the day because it was a friend's birthday um February 14th 1982 <laughs> was my my first pack of hockey cards uh I opened it up it was uh you know kind of like late afternoon and there was a Dave Hunter card in there um Edmonton Oilers which was my favorite team at the time it wasn't Gretzky I was hoping for Gretzky but you know, and there were enough of them in the set. There should have been one in there. Um, and I remember pulling Jim Corn's rookie card. Um, and he was kind of a tough guy for the Red Wings and uh, Devils and Maple Leafs in the 80s. And then from there, it just, it's, it, just, uh, it just kept going and kept going and kept going. Uh, by the mid-1980s, uh, I, was re- I, I picked up Andrew Poirichuk's, uh, one of his guides, and got the inkling that, hey, hockey cards have a value outside of just, you know, the sentimental value to them. There was something here. Um, And there, but most importantly, there was a history to them too, because I would see, you know, somebody would occasionally bring to school, they might have a card from like the the early seventies, or I remember one kid bringing in a a 5859 tops card one time and it blew my mind. And then within a few months, I'm reading Andrew's guide and uh, just uh, got it for my 10th birthday, just absorbing the thing. And as a result, 
by the end of that decade, I went to my first hockey card show in September 89. Uh, it was in Brighton, Ontario at the Odd Fellows Hall <laughs> in the basement. Uh, and I picked up a um, C55 uh, Jimmy Gardner. Uh, so one of those uh, tobacco cards from the 11-12 season. Um, he's a Hall of Famer, uh, Montreal Wanderers. He was actually a coach of the Canadians uh, and the Hamilton Tigers at different points in his career. Um, and I paid eight dollars. <laughs> to me, it was just like, you know, I'd been wanting one of those cards for about, you know, a, a vintage tobacco card like that for about four, three, four years at that point. And I just went out, got it, made it happen. <laughs> and uh, as a result, um, you know, also had a family member who w worked for a wholesaler. So I would get OPG uh, boxes of all sports and non-sports for basically cost. And um so I start building my collection that way. Uh, and then I would always be tr trading for, for new card, my, my newer cards for older cards, you know, just thinking, okay, well, this guy, you know, this guy's a hot rookie, this Bob Kadelsky, maybe I can get, you know, a 6970 common for him. <laughs> and somebody would do it very invariably. <laughs> like it was, it was fantastic. So I, I, I built a, you know, was building a very nice vintage collection along the way. Um, condition wasn't always important to me. Um, it was more about building the set. Um, and I didn't care if I got them signed. It was a big no-no back then, you know, in, in some people's eyes. And that thankfully has turned around now because people are suddenly like, oh, well, you know what? It's not that bad to get a Bobby Hall rookie card signed. <laughs> you know, if, it, if it's beat up, so what? You know, it's like, you want another one? Well, you know, go on eBay. You, within the next two weeks, there'll be one on there for you. <laughs> it's, it's just one of those things. So, um, so in 91, I, I set up at a card show for the first time, um, you know, just kind of weekend warrior type of stuff. But I, I never gave up on the hobby, you know, through high school, uh, into college. In, in college, I worked at uh, Game Breakers in, in Ottawa, well, Nepean. Um, and Hans was, uh, you know, patient with me while, you know, I was socially awkward, <laughs> that sort of thing. But um, but he, he obviously saw that like, I had a passion for the hobby and knowledge for it. So um, by the time I, I finished my first uh, diploma in public relations in Ottawa at Algonquin and then uh, came back home and did print journalism at Loyalist College at, in Belleville. And after when I was at Loyalist, I started uh, freelancing for Canadian Sports Collector, um, which is a magazine that you know people will, will remember. Um, and Baron Badesky, who was there, uh, get, gave me my first shot at, at writing a hobby article, and uh, it was it was fun, and it, you know I think it paid me seventy five dollars or something like that, which you know was pretty good when you're a college student in you know two thousand, but not today, not so much. <laughs> and um, so from there, I started working. I, I graduated and started working at um, at Slam Sports in uh, which is part of canoe and sun media and um you know i'm not a fan of sun media's leanings these days but you know looking back 20 years ago i needed a job <laughs> so um and and i was able to when once i went over to the slam side start an area called slam collectibles which was basically me doing hobby stories and getting all sorts of product to review and all that kind of stuff like and just having fun and enjoying the hobby and and sharing the news with with the world and i mean it got it got fairly decent traffic not great traffic but i was able to do it for about four um roughly four years and then during in that period um i started i built up a good relationship within the game because i knew baron bedusky um i got to know fabio del rio who worked there um and so i was able to start writing card backs on a freelance basis which was fantastic. Uh, to me, it was it was a dream come true. I mean, you know, to me, it, it, could it get any better than this? Well, yeah, it can get better than this, but it's pretty good. So um, it was at the um, 2004 World Cup, um, one of the my co-workers, uh, well, co-workers in a sense, uh, at, at in the game, uh, a guy named Michael Levitt, who was looking after photography for them at the time, uh, he, he and I were talking, um, sitting beside each other in the, in the press box. And after the game, um, he says to me, well, you know, uh, Fabio and I are, are, are leaving in the game. I'm like, oh, geez, well, that, I'm sorry to hear that. He's like, yeah, well, the, and it was because, you know, kind of a, a fallout from the, the NHLPA license moving to an exclusive with, with Albert Eck and that sort of thing. 
but he and he's but michael says to me he's like well would you want to come work it in the game <laughs> yeah <laughs> of course i would so two days later i'm having lunch with brian price and who, who, who i'd met before and you know i got to know, know just a tiny bit at that point and with you know by the end of that week i i'm the new vp product development <laughs> so uh, it was it was interesting because the with that position um i i was you know basically taking taking over two jobs and the functions of two jobs into one which was fine i, I was i was happy for 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 the for the experience and happy to be doing what i was doing uh i i just re remember the the first thing brian hit me with was 2004 nhl franchises which instantly became my baby <laughs> he just said build the checklist um and then we'll figure out who, who we need to sign and you know just you know basically we know you love hockey cards. We know that you love history. Just roll with this. And he let me roll with it. And the rest was history. I mean, to me, it's, it was almost a perfect retro product in a way. I mean, it, it sometimes retro products can be really good and sometimes they don't, they don't quite hit the mark, but I, I think with a lot of collectors, this hit the mark. At least I hope so. Um, I got to write all the card backs. I got to select the photos, um, you know, and but it also, you know, wrote, wrote wrote the bios on the back of the autographs, and I think there might have been bios on the back of the memorabilia cards too. It was a lot of writing, but I, I feel like I built the the hockey card set I always wanted to make. And it's like, well, where can it go from here? Well, <laughs> then, you know, no more NHL license. You know, soon after, and you you go into kind of a a reactionary mode and we did some really great stuff because we still had the chl license we still had the ahl license at the time we we also had so many deals with uh retired players we were we were able to do some really good stuff it, it i don't think it made some some people happy but at the same time it's you know, we're just trying to do do our best, and I think we managed to do some really good stuff. I, I do, I'm not a fan of the between pipes set we did in 0506, that horizontal one with the big heads. I don't know if you guys remember that one, but <laughs> that that was just it was that was a hard one for me to work on, and um, and also the the tough customers one that box set that came out around that time, but to me. I, I like the concept. I like the design. I like the checklist. But for some reason, when we got the cards printed, they came out uneven. If if you if you take one of the sets, you'll notice like there's kind of weird um, cuts on them. And to me, I, I would I just remember being so disappointed. But I knew that well, if they're printed, there's nothing we can do about it now. So uh, it, it it was a lot of fun. But a lot of people were were supportive at the time. A lot of people were angry um and they, ultimately it's business like it's it is what it is um you know kudos to brian for for sticking it out as, as long as he did um you know because i think he was able to listen to collectors i think he was able to determine that um it's it's okay to think outside the box a little bit and and we ultimately did that. Um, I, I was able to make some cards, you know, had they been licensed. Oh my God, they they would they would have been insane. Um, I'm, I'm thinking in particular, um, it was in one of the ultimate memorabilia sets. There was a triple autograph of the Winnipeg Hotline from the WHA uh, with uh, Alf Nelson and Anders Hedberg and Bobby Hall. Nobody had made an autograph card of those three at that point. And I'm thinking, well, now we're going to make it. <laughs> so, uh, but as a result, I mean, I got, I got to interact with a lot of retired players, guys I grew up watching, guys I had read about growing up and signed them to autograph deals. And when I'm talking to the, these guys, it's like they're listening because you're offering them money, <laughs> right? Um, but a lot of... Don't, if I could just yeah. interject here, as far as like signing players to autograph deals, um, this wasn't part of our questionnaire here, but... That's okay. um, 
Could you give a little bit of insight specifically about how someone would go about signing a player to sign some autographs? Um, sure. It's it. Sometimes it, it with, with retired tracking players, them down. <laughs> retired, it, it's the process of tracking them down. I, sometimes it was easy. You just look on 411.com and boom, there's player X or you already knew player Y. So you just send, send them, send them an email um, or, you know, your coworker might know, or, or another player that you do know knows them. Um, I remember getting Adam Oates through Brett Hall. <laughs> it was just like, you know, and it was the day, um, I believe the day that Adam Oates was inducted or in his uh, induction to the Hall of Hockey Hall of Fame was announced. I had Adam Oates' number and I was calling him that day. You were to, bugging him. You were bugging him just like, hey, man, I know you're kind of walking on stage right now, but. um. Oh, no, no, this cards. wasn't the. The induction. I'm sorry. This this was when the, just the announcement that he's you know, going in. Still, he's yeah. he's celebrating with his family. Hold on, I gotta take this. <laughs> and you know what? He took it. And oh, nice. Oh, yeah, but you know what? He he's a really fantastic guy. Like just down to earth. Um, he was he was just so happy just to to get involved in the project. And then, um, a couple of years later, he's um when he's coaching the Capitals, he's coming into Belleville, uh, for the um, what are those uh hockeyville games it was uh when washington and winnipeg and um that day uh, i said adam it's like well what are you doing uh, you know what's, what's your plan it's like well you know it come by and see me after practice and you know you know i'll sign some autographs and whatever it was great my, my daughter came with me she was only there to meet the mascots and get some hot chocolate and popcorn but <laughs> it was uh you know she was able to she was like we're gonna go meet mr oates i'm like yep <laughs> She's like, I'm like, you have no idea who he is. He probably like, thought he was like a cereal or something. Oh, exactly. Mr. Oates. Wow. <laughs> yeah. But, um, you know, she was a good sport about it. You know, she went and, uh, and, and, ha- and we had some fun. And, but the thing is, is I, I, I got to build a lot of good business relationships with people, but also relate to them on a, on a really human level you know because you you see these guys on tv growing up you think they're superstars they're you know they're never you know they'll never talk to you they'll never you know they're, they're busy they have their lives but you know you, you you get a chance to 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 just sit down and say hey you know um you know what do you think about doing some making some hockey cards and they're, they're i think they, they get it hockey players tend to get it there's a few guys who didn't sign over the years or weren't you know, we're easy to convince, but, um, you know, and some guys would, would hold you up for extra money, but <laughs> you know, those, those were very few and I'm not going to name names, but you know, one of them is dead at least. <laughs> yeah. I, I know that, but <laughs> or actually a couple of them have died. Um, and I don't mean to laugh about that and sound crass, but it's, um, if you agree to a deal, honor it, it, yeah. it it's, it's that simple. Um, you know, I mean, I had the the one guy call one of my coworkers back, uh, you know, just yelling and screaming about how I was trying to rip him off. And I'm just, oh my God, <laughs> it was just, it was terrible. And, and I'm just thinking, you agreed to this yesterday on the phone. <laughs> so or it I is think- what it is. I mean, we all have our, our, our things. Um, and to, to me, it, the experience, this, it was always fun. Um, I remember one time, um, I got a number for one Hall of Fame player who's a, d- a notoriously difficult signer. Um, found his number online, his home number, called, and his wife just chewed me out. Like it was just, it was like, oh, I guess he's not going to sign for sure. <laughs> so um, it, it just, it just, it's, it's kind of funny. It, it, but mo- most players were gen- generally very gracious about it. Um, and and they got it like it's it's they know it's like okay i'm gonna get x amount of money for signing x amount of autographs well okay you know it's it's like well i could do a card show you know once or twice a year or i could just sit at home and sign these cards or labels it's easy it's easy i'm not gonna um name his name right now i'll tell you after but my cousin is actually in the nhl so he signed some cards so um when you were saying that these guys get it i mean like like we've talked about it before, like he definitely gets it as far as like signing things for the players and stuff like that. And I think most players are, um, you know, like that. But um, I think also like, like as far as like uh, the players go, 
people often forget there, that there's agents as well, kind of involved in that too. Mm-hmm. So they might want a piece of that also. So it's a little bit of greed on their end sometimes why some autograph deals might not get done. Like I'm just assuming, but um, yeah, mm-hmm. it's kind of a messy world for some of their yeah. uh, reps and things like that. Um, I remember one time um, I was signing a, a, reti- a couple of retired goalies and I had previous est- previously established relationships with these guys. And some guy e- emails me wanting a cut. I couldn't believe it. I was just like, no, you know, I work with these guys. I've been working with these guys for years. Um, they don't. And I, and I said to the one guy, I was like, is like, are you serious? Like, is, is this, and he's like, I don't know why that guy sent me that email. Just like, oh, come on. <laughs> like, I, I don't know if the guy was trying to scam or if he felt, you know, he wasn't getting, you know, his, his proper do his proper respect, I guess. I, I, I don't know, but to me, it was just, I, it was so much easier just to deal with a player directly. Now, sometimes, but that was generally my, my role was to deal with the players directly. Um, Ken Whitmell, who worked for Brian for many, many years. Ken was one, the one who tended to deal with, um, with a lot of the, the bigger named Hall of Famers and, and, the, um, and any guys who might have an agent representative and that sort of thing. And, and to me, that was fine. It's like, you know, like occasionally I might have to call an agent who might represent somebody, but it, but it, if I hadn't dealt with the guy before, that was my way in. So it, it's, there were a lot, a lot of good times, um, you know, but then I'd see a guy at the expo who I'd signed to an autograph deal and I'd introduce myself and we'd talk for a few minutes because there was that, that, um, that name, rec- like we recognized each other's name and that sort of thing. And, and what we, we could do for each other so it was pretty fantastic like you know when i'm sitting there you know chatting with like kirk mclean or or jp parise um who who was amazing um you know when i was doing my book on nhl expansion uh it's called changing the game a history of nhl expansion (laughs) that came out in 2014 um he just you know it was it was great because you know he would tell me some incredible stories you know about you know the first year north stars and um, you know, how he was originally going to be a California seal before you know, and California became Oakland, became the California Golden Seals, just, you know, to, to clear up the timeline for everybody. Uh, so, uh, but he told me about, you know, the Bill Masterton incident, incident and how it, um, you know, how, how his relationship was with, with Masterton and that sort of thing. Um, and then, I just, when I was having another conversation with him, he couldn't remember when his first NHL goal was. And so, you know, me being the researcher that I am, I, you know, within 15 seconds, I had, I had that data for him and he was, he was so grateful. Like it was just, it was, a you know, just amazing, you know, to build a friendship with, with somebody like that. And I interviewed Zach a few years later, um, and, and told him about that, about that. And it was just, you know, I could tell like Zach was, you know, felt good to hear a good story about his dad. So I don't know where we left off. <laughs> oh, that's okay. I mean, that's a lot of background. So, and, and we'll touch on some of this stuff um, as yeah. well later, but that's totally cool. Um, you did mention specifically um, uh, writing the backs of cards. Mm. And if we could just touch on that um, a little bit and, and what you could tell us about the whole process of writing something on the backs of cards like for some players kind of like you know not mailing it you know or anything mm. like that but just sort of like I got to find something for this guy and then move on this checklist is huge and some <laughs> players might have been like you know you have a couple facts about him and it's kind of awesome deciding mm. what thing to put on on what card so if you yeah. can just explain a little bit about that process and how you did that okay um well it, it's funny because for me it's it, it's 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 become almost second nature at this point. I mean, I've written tens of thousands of card backs at the, at this point, and for for me, you know, it even with the first one, it, it just felt very natural. But I mean, being a, a trained professional writer, you usually approach things you know with a certain gusto, and and you get right into it. And sometimes magic happens, and that's kind of what happened with with, with writing hockey card backs for me. Um, sometimes they're they're not as easy. Um, you got to dig a little for information. Um, I remember, you know, doing things with um, with heroes and prospects years ago, where 
a guy would be just coming into to the OHL or the WHL from Europe. And, you know, at the time there wasn't a lot, a ton of information out there. Elite prospects was kind of, you know, just starting to be a thing and, and that sort of thing. So you, you really had to dig. And even when it comes to statistics, you, you you had to dig even more. So for me, you know, it was always, I love the challenge on, on ones like that. Um, it's like, at the same time, it's, you know, when you're writing the 12th card about a guy that year and the guy's only played three games, <laughs> you, got, you, you have to get a little creative. And, and, and to me, that's, that's fine. It's like I, I can, you know, I approach each card back, you know, professionally and, you know, I view it as an opportunity to educate somebody, you know, because people actually do read the card backs. Not everybody does, you know. Um, I don't think the people, you know, ripping them open uh, and, you know, for online breaks and that sort of thing are, are, are taking the time to read the backs. But the collector that ultimately receives that card generally does. You know, that was one of the things that I always enjoyed as a kid was reading the card backs. Um, some of them were hideously bad. Some of them were pretty darn good. Um, the, like it's Dick Duff's um, last active card from, from uh, 71, 72 Apici. Uh, I always remember it said, when Dick announced his retirement, it ended a career. Really? Wow. Really? Hard hitting. Yeah. That, that's some, some hard hitting insight. <laughs> but at the, at the same time, or the um, 82, 83 Opeaches, where whoever it was was just pulling out the media guides and saying, Bob is a bachelor, or Mitch is married, his wife's name is Darlene. Like it, it was just like, it, was, it wasn't the most creative time sometimes, but. Um, I always loved loved the comics on the back too, and I really wish that was something that would come back at least once once a year in a product. You know, you know, just hire some you know somebody in your art department to to do little cartoons. And I mean, even if some of the cartoon graphics get repeated, you know, just put little facts in there. I think that would be, you know, a, a nostalgia thing that people would really enjoy. Um, you know, especially kids. But I mean it's not necessarily a hobby about kids anymore, right? So, you know, you, you, you know, the altruistic side of you thinks, well, okay, you know, yeah, it would be great to have more kids in the hobby and that sort of thing. And I think a lot of parents that did collect, you know, try to instill a little bit about card collecting into their kids today. I tried with my daughter, it didn't take. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it, it, and I tried with my nephews and again, didn't take, I mean, my oldest nephew just turned 14 the other day. He'd rather be playing Minecraft or, um, oh, what's, uh, not PUBG. What's the other one with the guns? Uh, uh, I can't yeah, that one. I don't know. That one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and he, he'd tried. rather, yeah, it, but he'd rather be doing that. Um, you know, my other nephew, he's, uh, you know, he does dance. Like it, it to me, it, it's like, but he, he's found his passion. Like he's like me at that age. It's like, you know, I'm 11. I found my passion. <laughs> you know, I remember 11 years old, you know, trying to draw out hockey card designs. Like that's how early that, that was in my brain. And I, and I'm not a, the most graphically inclined person. Um, and you could probably blame me for the 0708 Heroes and Prospects base card design because I, I wanted it as a nice riff off of 80, 8, uh, 68, 69 Opeachy. And it gave me what I wanted, but I don't know if it gave everybody else what they wanted. But that's, uh, that's just kind of a, a, fu a fun um, little, little tribute that, uh, to, for me, for one of my favorite sets, it was just like, okay, let's do something similar, but not too similar that we could get sued over. <laughs> but... Uh, yeah, Brian went with it, uh, you know, to his credit. <laughs> so, you know, he, he uh, you know, he was willing to listen to ideas that that's, um, you know, sometimes he'd blast them out of the room. <laughs> but <laughs> we've talked yeah. to Brian a, a few times on this podcast. He's a great guy. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, he's uh, he, he he's he's mellowed out, it seems a little bit, which is which is good. Um, you know, there, there were some, some tense times in the office sometimes, but I think it was his passion for the hobby coming through more than anything else. Um, you know, his, you know, his passion for, for business too. I mean, you know, he's, he's a, he's a smart businessman. I, I, the, the amount of lessons I learned working under him, um, you know, I'll take with me for the rest of my life. Like it, it's, it's just that, that, that remarkable. Um, but we had a really good staff there. Um, you know, Todd Bennett was our main designer and 
you know, as much as people kind of like to crap on it in the game designs back then, you know, because it, it, I, I believe me, we read the message boards <laughs> and, um, you know, it was, you know, I saw the, the energy that Todd put into things and the creativity he put into it. And you know what, it's, it, to me, it's like, and I wasn't afraid to tell him, it's like, I don't think this will work. Or I think that, you know, do, you know, maybe tweak this here or that sort of thing. And, you know, he, 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 you know, he was the guy who would listen. He, he's the guy who hand drew the, um, the artwork, uh, the, the player artwork for the 05, 04, 04 or 05 franchises. I still remember him, you know, with a marker on, on an eight, eight by 10 um, top loader and with a piece of paper underneath and he drew out the, the players. Like to me, it was just like, wow, this is, this is amazing. But he, you know, he's a great friend. He ended up working, you know, in movies you know, uh, you graphic graphics for movies like it. And I mean, he's doing other stuff now, but, you know, uh, very proud of him. Um, Ken Whitmell, uh, you know, he was a dedicated soldier. Let, let's just put it that way. I think, you know, he, 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 how he managed to, to, um, to not, you know, have his head explode, you know, whether it was dealing with me or, you know, just dealing with, uh, you know, 38,000 things coming his way. It was fantastic. June Green was the accountant and, you know, just a wonderful human being. Um, you know, it, it, and uh, Chris Berlinghoff in the back, he was the, one, of the, one of the people uh, cutting up the jerseys. And, um, you know, Angie Savati was there. She did some stuff with Benchwarmer years ago too. Uh, and just trying to think of who else off the top of my head. Um, Eric Brown. Um, which people might remember as Silent Brown from the old Hobby Insider days way back when. Um, you know, Eric worked there for many years. Uh, you know, it was just a very, you know, it was, it was a good family atmosphere at times. Um, you know, they, people were, were dedicated to making the best possible products we could. Um, it, it was really, you know, under the limitations that, that we had at the time, so. Yeah, for sure. And you know, going back to that content, you know, the quality content and going back to writing card backs a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, would you say that there are any card backs that you wrote that really stick out to you, whether that be because of what specifically you, you wrote or, you know, maybe it was just a really significant card or, you know, okay. whatever it might be? Um, off the top of my head, um, anytime I made a mistake that was pointed out, that's always stood out. Um, I, I remember, and I don't have no idea why this happened. I, I said Mike Bossy won two Lady Bing trophies instead of three. And to me, it's like, you know, most people might not catch that, but somebody did catch it. <laughs> and, you know, I heard about it. You know, to me, what bothered me more that was, you know, if we received an image from a photography supplier, it wasn't tagged properly. And it was a guy where, you know, wearing the same jersey number you know, just was a different season or earlier in the season and we didn't catch it. Oh, oh, it, it, it stuck like a knife into me every time it was spotted. And it, it, it is no matter how much you tried, you know, and you're going through thousands of images, thousands upon thousands of images. And, you know, some guys are instantly recognizable. It's like, okay, that's Glenn Anderson. I know his mustache, <laughs> right? But, you know, sometimes it's like the difference between a Jeff Chikrin and a, and a Todd Ellick. Like, could you, could, could you spot, spot the difference between them? If you, yeah, <laughs> exactly, right? So, um, but for, in terms of card backs, I don't know. They're, they're all so, so fun. Like, it, to me, it's just, I like, I like when I can fit maybe an obscure uh, stat in, or if I can, um, when I was doing a lot, a lot of rookie stuff last season, for upper deck, anytime I could mention the Belleville Senators um, on, on a card was always, especially if it was a game I went to, it was always it was always fun because it's like to me that's a, that's a connection there. Um, I think I did that with a, a Matt Duchesne card as well uh, for 0708 Heroes and Prospects because I think I was at a game and mentioned mentioned it, but I'm not 100 percent sure. I know I saw him early on. I know he had a good game, and I probably was inclined to write about it. So. Um, you, you kind of fit, fit those fun little things in. Um, even sometimes if you, if you get a, ch a chance to be like cheesy and creative, I remember on a Yaromir Yager card, I put the term moves like Yager, like that old, that song from a few years back, moves like Jagger, moves like Yager. 
yeah. So you, you try to have fun with it, but it's, you can't dwell on it too long. You have to be able to just, okay, well, I got this. Okay. Move on to the next, move on to the next, move on to the next. And yeah, I, I just, you know, it, it's always nice seeing the, the results of your, your labor. I mean, today in the mail, I got um, the uh, Tampa Bay Lightning Stanley Cup championship uh, set that, that Upper Deck put out as a promotional item. And I wrote the backs for those. Like, to me, that was like, that was nice to see awesome. that. I mean, yeah, it, it's nice to see. And I mean, the, the fact is, is, you know, today I'm writing for products that, you know, I can't afford, <laughs> you know, on my salary. Uh, but to, to me, it's, it's like, you know, I know when I see them, you know, it, it, it's, a, it's a really great feeling. Absolutely. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you, you talked about this earlier, uh, toward the beginning, but Hmm. one thing that I really wanted to hear you talk about, you know, is 2004 or five in the game franchises, which, you know, I think it's safe to say many collectors would argue is one of, if not the best product ever made, you know, and and as far as the hockey card hobby goes, Wow. Um, you know, and we talked about, you know, you, you shared about, you know, the large part that you had in making that product a reality. Um, Mm -hmm. so so what can you share about that product, you know, kind of, a little bit more about how it came to be and maybe what some of the goals of that product were. Well, it, it's funny because basically the day after Brian offered me the job, uh, he sends me an email because he, he's like, oh, well, just, you know, we'll start you up later in the week and that sort of thing. I'm like, hey, that's cool. Um, so I think it was a Thursday or Friday and he sends me an email. And he's like, this is the project we're working on. He's, he sends me a PDF, I think, with the design, which instantly I'm like, well, I know that what that reminds me of because it's basically an inverted 6677 Tops of Peachy design, you know, with just with a different with the, the toned borders and and that that sort of thing. Um, and no logos, I think the, the logo placement and that sort of thing. Like there's there's definite differences. And not legally. <laughs> and um, so and then he just sends me this partial, this spreadsheet, like this partial spreadsheet. So the, the, the product had already been essentially um, conceived by the time I got there. You know, it was just basically, um, so I, could, I was able to instantly adopt it, you know, and, you know, but it was, no, no it, was, it was such a, a great team collaboration, um, you know, because, you know, I was, you know, learning under fire, basically, about photo selection and that sort of thing, about what photos could fit on the card within the design, you know, what, what do we have in our archive that we could use, because, you know, you, you, you know, what, with retired players, you only have a finite amount of, of photos, and a lot of people were critical of that over the years, but I don't, they don't think they had realized how tough it might be to find you know, another photo of George Vesna. I'm just saying. <laughs> and one that's going to fit on a card and it's not going to be too blurry and yep. things like that. So it's like, yeah, I mean, I, I've heard about people uh, complaining about that sort of stuff as well, like especially within the game and their vintage content. But I mean, mm-hmm. what are you going to do? You know, well, what could you do? Like Getty the, the, images didn't exist, man. Well, actually Getty did exist. At the, My bad. Well, I the, suck. Way, back when, way back when, way back when. <laughs> way back when you're right. i don't know anything i'm just going to quit my own podcast continue <laughs> continue the, well it's it's funny because getty did take over in 04 as the official photography supplier for the nhl at that point um they were they were starting to you know get all the uh, team photographers under their banner um which was it so basically the photographers had their own archives for prior that's to cool. 2000, 2004 that that's cool i didn't know that they could share that they legally. That's interesting. Yeah, so you know, I had my, I had my, my suppliers. Um, I'm not going to name names. No, it's okay. <laughs> um, but you know, and, and I think the statute of limitations might be over on that. Um, but you know, there, there was also um, a friend of mine who I knew from card shows when I was a teenager. He had, at one point, the largest uh, private hockey photo archive. Um, he had basically anybody that ever played an NHL game he had. So if I needed a shot of Claude Provost, um, you know, who some argue should be a hall of famer from the Canadians, you know, you know, two played two dynasties. I mean, come on, (laughs) but, um, and, you know, fantastic defensive forward. Um, I could call Doug and say, and Doug McClatchy is is the guy's name. I, I could say Doug, 
you know, I need these players in these uniforms. Do you have them? And he'd, you know, he'd send it to me through my old hotmail address <laughs> and, uh, and we'd get them on the cards. And, you know, once the product comes out, he gets paid, he's happy, you know? Um, but with, but it was, yeah, it, it was tough sometimes, you know, trying to dig up uh, new photography. Um, we had some great sources, but at the same time, it was just like, oh my God, like, where am I, you know, why can't I find a third shot of this guy? Or why can't I find, you know, this guy at all? You know, it was, it was an inter interesting time. Like um, for O4 or Fry franchises, for example, there's no known photo of any sort of clarity of a guy named Paul Jacobs. And I don't know if you guys know who Paul Jacobs was. No, but he's probably a ghost. He always oh, ghost now. <laughs> um, but Paul Jacobs is purported to be the first Aboriginal player in NHL history. Oh, uh, that's cool. Purported to be, mind right? You, for the uh, I think eighteen nineteen uh, Toronto Arenas, or they were just called officially just called the Torontos, where the but they played out out of an arena, right? So, um, so with Jacobs only. It's, it was at one point believed he played four or five games at one point because he appeared on in newspaper reports on the roster. Um, the, but the NHL, I think, only had him as playing one game. But there's no proof either way. Like, he, he's one of hockey's greatest mystery man, in my opinion. Um, and, I mean, he was from the reserve out near Montreal. You know, he, I think he, he, he was like a lacrosse player out there, possibly, too. And, yeah, he's just this great mystery man. Well, I wanted to make a hockey card of him. And then I quickly realized there are no photos. <laughs> so that didn't happen. I wanted it to happen so badly, but you know, what can you do? Yeah. Like I always love hearing about like the creation of cards and, and photos is something that it's so obvious, but I think people so like they overlook it so much for something that's so obvious, you know, mm -hmm. and um, getting that right shot, even in modern times can, can really make a difference yeah. for, like versus, you know, the, the standard game shot, like the upper deck canvas cards that we see now, it's, it's mm -hmm. kind of like, you know, this crazy, cool, artistic kind of photo. And it really does make a difference, it but does. enough about photos and stuff like that. Um, as far <laughs> as um, the entire product went, um, mm -hmm. Like I know it's kind of hindsight is 2020, but, and there's always things that you would have like done different maybe, but mm -hmm. how did that product go in terms of what your expectations were, what the expectations that were given to you say by Brian, like, here's what we want versus the end product. Like, did it live up to everyone and their expectations, including yourself? I think it actually surpassed our internal expectations. Cause I mean, it's sold, it's sold through. Yeah. Um, you know, it's old enough to do an update set too, which is crazy tough to find, right? So yeah, I, yeah. and then we might have only done a few thousand of those, um, by comparison to you know several hundred cases of East, West, and Canadian. Um, the main disappointment I think I have myself with that is uh, two mislabeled photos: uh, <laughs> Roy Conacher and um, I think Mud Burnito. I think were. Uh, they were the supplier uh, didn't match them properly, and you know I should have really should have caught the Conacher because um, I think it was Bill Cowley or vice versa on the card, and the Bernato. Uh, yeah, it happens, <laughs> and um, so. But also, if I could go back, I probably would have switched the Pittsburgh Penguins back into, into the East properly because they were put in West because they were originally a West division team under the 67 expansion. So that's why they appear in there. And then people were a little, little critical of it at the time. Like not, you know, super critical, but you know, enough to make for me to think, Oh, well, yeah, maybe I should have done it that way. And you know what? It probably would have made the East pro Lemieux's presence alone would have made that East product a better sell through. Um, because I mean, it sold out from the factory, but I, I know East stood on dealer tables the longest of the three. Canadian was a smash hit from the start. I mean, you know, prices on those boxes jumped dramatically and very quickly. Um, West kind of, you know, you know, chugged along and then East just, uh, it was, it was the weakest of, of the three. Yeah. If I could go back and fix that. Yeah. I, I would, would fix that in, in an instant. 
Interesting. You know, it, yeah, it was just, you know, it, uh, it was a matter of, you know, at that point, it would have been like the East would have been like the fourth or fifth product I might have worked on at that point, you know, because there were other things going on that year, like Ultimate was going on, on that year, Ultimate 5th Edition, um, Heroes and Prospects, the first release of that, and the update set was going on at that time. So, I mean, we were, we were busy, um, but yeah, I, I should have, shouldn't have been so, so short-sighted on that one. I, that's, that's a, a mild regret. And kind of going along with that, you know, kind of looking maybe more on the positive side, Mm. Looking back after all these years, what would you say stands out to you most about the product? Um, for me, it, it's, it's, a, it's a thing that stood out for me, I think, from the beginning. It's the hockey card set I always wanted to make as a kid. And I think for some people, it's maybe the card set they would have liked to have seen um, growing up. It's like, oh, it's got the greats and it's got, you know, you know, guys from the 80s and guys from the 90s. And it, it just kind of came together perfectly. It had, you know, all that vintage memorabilia, those vintage memorabilia cards in it. It had, you know, two or three autographs per box, hard signed, except for the Lemieux. Um, not, to, I don't know if people know, it's the Lemieux is actually a, a sticker on that. Um, and then, you know, it just came together. And the, with the update set, there were those line mates cards with the three pieces of memorabilia and they were limited to I think five copies a piece or something ridiculous like that. And I can't imagine those cards not doing well whenever, if they ever show up on the secondary market again. So it, to me, it was, it was, it was an all around, you, you know, it was a, it was a good time. It was a good feeling. That's good. The, the thing that uh, struck me the most was more just um, when you mentioned um, building the set, that you want as a kid. I mean, I think we've all kind of asked ourselves what kind of card set we would make or what kind of card product that we would like to see made at least. And mm -hmm. so the fact that you get to be a collector first and foremost, and then grow up and being able to create your own product. I think mm -hmm. that's something that uh, a lot of us can only dream of. So that's always really cool hearing about mm -hmm. the product, but also hearing about your experience, just building that. And that's just really, really cool. And now I know this is kind of like a family show sort of, but uh, um, you did obviously work with uh, Beckett and Upper Deck. Um, mm -hmm. What can you tell us about those experiences? Well, I'll start with the positives. Uh, uh, Upper Deck is an amazing company to work with. Um, you know, uh, Chris Carlin and I d developed a pretty good friendship uh, when I was working at Beckett and um, you know, and that, that it, you know, still continues like to this day. Um, he's one of my favorite people in this world, really. He, he's just fantastic. Um, and the guy, uh, Roland Hacker, who uh, assigns me my work, he is, you know, he's a huge Blackhawks fan and, um, you know, very knowledgeable about the game. Uh, you know, and, you know, I mean, hell, we, we message each other, you know, while, while the Hawks are playing or whatever. <laughs> it's, it's just like, you know, it, it's good. You know, it's like he's in California, but I'm here. And it's like, you know, we're just kind of, you know, talking hockey. So, um, you know, and Upper Deck's been really good to me. And, and, you know, they've had me come in for the NHLPA Rookie Showcase a couple of times and uh, interview the players for Facebook Live and, and that sort of thing, which, you know, to me, it, it's, it's a really neat thing because, um, you're seeing these guys getting their, their pictures taken for their cards. Um, you know, some of them are, you know, actually collected a little bit or they get it, which, which, which is really important. Like the, at the 2019 showcase, um, you know, it's just, every kid was just, you know, so keen about what was going on. Um, you know, it was, it was like Ty Smith for the devils or, um, I think Noah Dobson for the Islanders was there. Uh, you know, Igor Shesterkin was there uh the hughes brothers um that, that that was just you know and i've been to the showcase since uh 2014 with johnny gaudreau and aaron Eckblad and then mcdavid and Eichel the next year and that sort of thing so it, it's like you know it, it's really neat to you know to interview these guys and and talk with them you know as they're you know getting their pictures taken for their hockey cards it, it's you know it, it it's just it's just a really fun experience so upper deck affording me that opportunity to do that uh, it means a tremendous amount to me. You know, also Jason Mashera, the Upper Deck's head honcho, like he's, you know, fantastic guy. It's, it's just, you know, from the top on down, um, you know, I've always been treated quite well. 
And I, I genuinely appreciate that. But when it comes to Beckett, I mean, it's it started out nicely. Let, let's let's just put it that way. Um, when I was still working for In the Game, Susan Logarash, um, who people will know as Sue's online, um, who now works for Golden Auction, she was working for Tops for a bit. She was running um, Beckett basketball, possibly Beckett football, and uh, Beckett hockey at the time. And um, I asked her, you know, hey, can I write a couple articles here and there? And she said, yeah, and she said, yeah, sure. And, you know, it got me in there, so to speak. And then with um, In the Game being sold, um, Bill Dumas, who was a former Beckett employee, um, basically I said to him, it's like, you know, you know, it's kind of expressing my disappointment. Oh, it's kind of coming to an end and that sort of thing. He's like, well, it's like, but I, and I said, well, I really like writing for you guys. Hopefully you can do some more. And he's like, well, you might be able to get do a lot more <laughs> because Suze was leaving to go to Tops. So I applied, um, you know, by the end of June, 2014, um, I'm the new editor of Beckett Hockey. Uh, to me, which was fantastic because at age 14, I remember seeing that first issue with Gretzky on the cover. Um, you know, I didn't always agree, always agree with the content in there over the years or, you know, pricing on things or whatever, like most collectors. I mean, we, we ha all have our opinions and we all have, you know, very strong opinions when it comes uh, to Beckett, right? So, um, so I'm kind of thrown into the fire a little bit because I know it's, you know, in that period, original content in a sense, wasn't a huge focus because there was a lot of, you know, graphics where it's like, oh, well, here's this player and this is how many cards are in our database and blah, 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 blah. And this is what they're worth. Like, Honestly, who cares? <laughs> like, you know, you, you can go on online and find that information. How about g telling me a story? <laughs> like, it, it, honestly, like, tell me a story about the hobby history or new hobby discovery or interview a player. So be, with my journalistic background, naturally, I'm, my, my goal was to start making Beckett feel, Beckett hockey, and I was took over basketball at the start of, of my tenure there too. Um, and I'm not much of a basketball fan like I, I i enjoy basketball but i'm not knowledgeable about basketball so it was a bit awkward at times doing content on that on that side <laughs> but you know i got to meet some really cool players <laughs> you know got to meet Shaq. hey that's all right nice he's huge <laughs> you know, he's, he's, don't make him mad no you know what he, he he was it was actually at an upper deck party um at the 2014 national and um you know, it was at this bowling alley in uh, in Cleveland, and he, he was there just having the time of his life. And people were, you know, just loved having him there. It was it was one of those diamond dealer type type events. It was it was pretty fit. amazing, really. Um, so I have a selfie with Shaq, which is which is kind of hilarious. Um, so the um, with with ho the hockey side, I just remember in the in the in the nineties, especially that. You could pick up back at hockey and you could read about a player and there, you know, there'd be a little bit about his cards, but you'd read about, you know, how the player's doing this year or that, that, that sort of thing. And I instantly brought that back. So I had players that I was, you know, had established relationships with. I knew I could call them and say, you know, Hey, do you have half an hour? And, you know, we'd bang out an interview and I'd have a story for the, for the next issue. It was, it was, and I, and I still have a lot of those interviews banked <laughs> because I would just call these guys and, you know, we, we, we'd, you know, chew the fat and there we go. It's, uh, you know, it's amazing, you know, maybe, you know, I, I don't know if that stuff will ever see the light of day, but it, it's, it's pretty cool content. So, you know, it was kind of like, okay, you know, I got to achieve this balance between hobby news, hobby history and today's, and today's players, you know. You know, and and I think I, achieve, I I was able to achieve that. You know, I used some some pretty good freelancers for for additional content. Um, you know, and at one point they had me take over uh, Beckett's work card monthly as well, um, which was nice. Um, you know, the money was decent. You know, but but I I often found myself um, at loggerheads with upper management because I don't know if it was a culture of distrust there that I was coming in from, you know, a company that was known as being kind of a renegade in, in the trading card industry. But, you know, there, there were times where I was essentially bullied by upper management, you know, like treated very poorly. And, you know, you, 
as much as you you think, oh, I, I should stand up for myself, you're thinking, well, no, I need to pay the bills. And, and it's, 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 it's a really tough thing sometimes. Um, you know, I, I have no respect for, you know, my managing editor that I had it, or the, um, I don't remember what his title was, but, you know, he, he was just awful to me. And, um, but it was manipulative. That, that was part of the problem. I had Bill Dumas looking after me, at, you know, initially, and it was easy peasy. And then once Bill was shuffled back onto his ad duties full time, you know, that was that. And so I was often at loggerheads. I, and my, part of my problem was, is I took on too much ownership with the hockey magazine. I felt that I can make this content, I can get it done quickly, and I'm going to get it done the way I want it. <laughs> so I might as well just write it. <laughs> and um, so as a result, you know, I often butted heads a little bit with Ryan Cracknell, um, who, you know, it's, it's not a bad guy, you know, uh, people genuinely like Ryan. Um, it's just, you know, uh, I was being territorial. I, I felt threatened. You know, here, here comes that emotional honesty. <laughs> and um, so could I have acted differently in different situations? Yeah, probably. Should I have? Yeah, probably. <laughs> so, um, you know, but I also had to deal with the fact that, you know, the higher ups that, you know, that own Beckett and, you know, were, were being tight fisted with money. Like I had to pay my own way for train ticket and meals and everything to go to the 2016 World Cup of Hockey Media Day, paid out of my own pocket, got 30 interviews that day, a year's worth of content that they would have had to pay. We're talking like $10,000 and they couldn't have funded me $150 for the train and lunch. You know, but you know, then again, um, that that w way up guy at Beckett is uh, isn't he being indicted these days uh, for some sort of bribery scheme in one of the I have Carolinas? Yeah, no I'm like, I don't lose when it comes to that stuff. <laughs> that's okay. But that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> but to me, it's I'll just Google like it after. Yeah, you should. Um, I'll see if I can fi find it. I I can't even remember the guy's bloody name. <laughs> Go figure. Um, and it's uh, but you know, it's funny. It's the people I worked with otherwise at Beckett generally were really good. Eric Norton was fantastic. Um, my designers uh, were amazing. Um, Bill Dumas was great. Priscilla Torres was great. Um, the guys on the, on the grading side were always super awesome. I, I enjoyed interactions with Steve Grad, who was doing, you know, start up the Beckett authentication. Um, but yeah, it's just the two bosses, man. Like they just soured me on that experience. So um, I remember the day they had to let me go because they were cutting all the, decided to cut all the freelance editors for the magazines that were gonna take it in house, you know, with people, people who didn't, you know, actually know how to write about the hobby, number one. <laughs> but um, so I reacted very poorly. The, I, I didn't just burn a bridge, I torched it. Like, you know, threw the gasoline on, threw the match, uh, might have told Mike Payne to go do something with himself. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it was, but you know what? I don't regret it. At, at this point, I do not regret it. Like for all the things that, you know, I've been through health wise, you know, mental, physical, whatever, you know, I'm at such a better place now. It, it doesn't matter anymore. It, it's just, you know, it, like I, I think about my experience there is I got to go in and fulfill my mission of making the magazine feel like it did 20 some years earlier. Um, and it's funny, you know, when we talk about today's hobby, about five, five, six years ago, I remember doing an editorial piece predicting the hobby boom coming back. I didn't think it would take a pandemic to do it, <laughs> but I, I, I just basically talked about the boom bust echo theory, of, you know, the economic theory where it's like, you know, yeah, the hobby boomed in the 90s. Oh, it busted. <laughs> and then the echo effect is now, you know, it's like, but I thought it was going to be more organic with, you know, adults re-embracing collecting and, and sharing with the children. Uh, that's not really how it's happened. <laughs> so, um, but, you know, my heart was in the right place. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Um, I, I did Google it. So if you want to know the guy's name, I can tell you, unless that would trigger you, but... <laughs> it won't trigger me. Uh, Greg Lindbergh. That's it. That's it. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. So, um, 
Yeah, I, I'm kind of interested to see how that that one develops. I, I I'm gonna be honest. It's always <laughs> interesting hearing like the inside stories about this stuff. Like I personally like Beckett for what it represented for me, like as a kid with the magazine. So mm-hmm. like I'm always gonna have that soft spot for Beckett. Uh, like I know you're gonna kill me, for <laughs> saying that, but no, no. It, it uh, honestly, I had the same yeah. soft spot too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I and think we all do. Sour. Yeah, I yeah. think we all do. And then there's that human element, that employer element, which kind of obviously is is not nice to see um, mm. from those individuals. But I think we can agree that it's not, you know, everyone's wrongdoing here. It's only, you know, those select few. And majority mm. of people, like I would think at Beckett, we're, we're solid individuals. Yes. And um, I think that's the, the main takeaway, And unfortunately, with all the bad stuff involved too. Yeah. Yeah. And, it, and it's, it's interesting. It's, um, I, I honestly don't think they care about editorial content over there. It, it's a company that's there to sell grading services at this point. It, that's all it is. You know, they, they just keep the, the, the content there just to satisfy the old school collectors. Well, guess what? The old school collectors are going to die off at some point. You know, just, you might as well kill the mag now, honestly. Like, you know, when was the last time you bought one? Um, I was featured in one in 2019. So that was the only reason why I bought one okay. before that. It was like, I want to say 2005, six, seven. Oh, you didn't even buy one while I was there. Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm going to go back and pick up the back issues just for you. Yeah. You're going to have to. <laughs> yeah. Pretty much. I have to now, yeah. um, you know, you're a friend of the show. So I, I, I at least owe you that much. So yeah. Yeah. Like, I have one from earlier, but I, I don't know. I, I got to check. Yeah. Yeah, I had a subscription for quite a few years growing up. I I loved, you know, all the articles back in, I think it was probably mid-2000s to maybe around 2010 okay. or so, somewhere in there. Um, love, I mean, I always look forward to getting mm-hmm. a new one. But, yeah, I mean, then, you know, I think growing up and kind of, maybe having a little bit better understanding of how the hobby actually worked um, more of what Beckett was providing at that point in time didn't appeal to me as much. So I think we just kind of felt it wasn't really worth it anymore. Um, I always loved the rookie Rolodex issues. A funny story with the rookie Rolodex. um, It was one of those things I wanted to do every year, but there was a year where because of some sort of advertising thing or something, I wasn't allowed to do it that year. And I think it was the McDavid year of all years, or it might've been the year before. I can't remember exactly, but the problem is, is that I said to them, well, why don't we do it as a, you know, a supplement? We'll just print it. People want it every year. People count on it. And, you know, it was just discounted. Like it's, it's like the person who discounted it had been there, you know, since the eighties, since the eighties, like off and on since the eighties and didn't get it. But, you know, the problem is, is, Sometimes people in the hobby become hobby dinosaurs, right? It's like, yeah, you've been in the hobby forever, but are you really keeping up on things? Are you really, you know, understanding what your audience wants? And when you get to that point, it's kind of sad, you know, and, you know, for me at this point, you know, it's like, I'm at an arm's length with the hobby in a sense, you know, it's like, you know, my collection's gone up for sale. I do the freelance work, uh, you know, and I still pay attention to the hobby. I, I still f- follow the hobby news, but I know there's going to come a day where I'm just going to be like, has it passed me by? NFTs is one of those things that's making me th- think, what the heck is going on here? I don't think I'll ever know what an NFT is. Like someone can yeah. explain it to me, you can write a book and sell it to me about it. And I will still never understand what it is. Yeah. It's, just, um, just it's funny. The, the, the other day, um, the New Jersey Devils uh, tweeted out the NFT that they're doing. Well, I, I just screenshotted the thing and, 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 and then I put up a, a, a smart ass tweet saying, you, uh, like that old um, anti piracy ad. And I said, you wouldn't screenshot an NFT. <laughs> like it was just, but it's, 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 it's honestly like there's tops apps that are essentially NFTs if you think about it. You know, it's, it's like in, in a sense, in a broad sense. I mean, yeah, I know like the top skate app where you get the cards, like the autograph card, patch cards, but they're yeah. all electronic and you got to yeah. own the, the card. Yeah. But it's like, it's like when tops did that NFT recently with their baseball set, 
and they're doing an NFT of a Mike Trout autograph. And it's not even a, you know, it's not an actual autograph. It's a digital autograph. Well, I get the same thing on, on the app. <laughs> I, I, I just, it blows my mind. I'm thinking somebody spent thousands of dollars on that. But did they really spend those? I, I don't know. It, 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 it's just, I don't know if cards and NFT should mix in a sense. Like it's going, it's, it, it, inevitably it will. I think all the manufacturers are probably going to jump on that train. And if it makes the money, hey, great. You know, it, it's, it's not for me, you know, but it's for somebody else. And, and that's the thing in the hobby that, you know, I think a lot of us kind of lose perspective on. It's like, you know, one person, I, person's idea of the hobby is different than another's. And, you know, they always say that there's no wrong way to collect. Um, and I'm inclined to agree with that. You know, I mean, for me, you know, I wasn't picky about condition on vintage cards. You know, I just wanted to make a set. Well, to somebody else, they'd be like, well, why did you do it that way? Why didn't you just slow, you know, do a slower build? It's like, well, I'm not patient in that regard. <laughs> so, and I can always upgrade later. That was always my idea. Okay, I can upgrade later. So, um, but ultimately, you know, did the thrill of the chase make me happy? Absolutely. Did the sense of accomplishment of building, you know, a 57, 58 top set feel great? Yes, it did. But it, at some point, you know, a few months ago, when I realized I'm spending 50% more on common vintage cards and I'm having to compete a lot more for them, it, it, it just kind of made me feel a little bit like, what am I doing? Like I've spent 40 years of my life doing this and, and for what? Like my kid's not gonna, gonna care for this. My nephews aren't gonna care for this. The market suddenly becomes very hot and I'm thinking, well, there's things I haven't done in my life. You know, there's some bills I'd like to pay. So, you know, I, I think I can still enjoy the hobby. I can still be happy about the hobby. I still hung on to my 81, 82 OPG set. I hung on to, um, two, I have two of the three uncut sheets from that set, you know, that I'd like to frame up someday. I have a Layla Anderson autograph, uh, the little girl who uh, was in, helped, you know, support the, the Blues win the Stanley Cup. I have one of her signed cards. That meant a great deal to me because there's such a great story behind it. Oh, but you'll like this one. I did keep a Marc-Andre Fleury autograph patch from the cup. I think it was from 2012, 13, where he's wearing the mask with the hockey cards on it. You know, you, do you remember the one I'm talking about? Yeah. Yep. You know, the in the game cards on it, that on an upper deck card. There you go. Um, awesome. There must be some weird backhanded copyright thing going on there. <laughs> uh, well, well, masks are treated That's as editorial fun. content, right? Okay. Yeah. So, um, you know, that's why on Between the Pipe sets, you always saw the goalies wearing their mask because it was treated as editorial content. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, the league or whatever might disagree that, uh, on that, but that's not my battle. That's a, That was Brian's battle to deal with. So um, with that card, the cards that appeared on that mask, I was the one who selected the photos. I wrote the backs on those cards, the, the original cards. You know, so to that's have so cool. the Fleury's, you know, mask that- He's wearing you know, your cards. That, yeah, that featured cards I did. You know, like Todd was the one who designed them. You know, the uh, the photos were, you know, that, that were used on the cards were from the original photographers or whatever. But, you know, it, it's, it, it makes you feel that much more connected to the game itself. If, I, if that mask ever came out for auction, oh, I'd be so tempted. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't, I don't think Flurry sells his masks, though. I'm not 100% sure. I think he keeps them. So yeah. um, a lot of guys do, but... Um, yeah, it would be interesting if one day he eventually parts with some stuff. I know that Ed Belfour uh, a couple of years ago sold off almost everything he had. Mm -hmm. There's a mask. He sold off his Olympic medal. He sold off literally everything he had to, yep. to start to fund his uh, new whiskey business. With yes. His family. So he yep. sold off everything he had. So yep. you never know. Never well, it, it's funny because when I was working at Beckett, I, um, I called up Mark Chouteau from, from Classic and, um, and Mark I've known for, for many years and I've, you know, done freelance work for Mark and that sort of thing. And he's the guy selling my collection right now. <laughs> so, well, we um, yeah. So it's um, with, with Mark, he, he set up an interview with, with Ed and probably talked with, with Ed for a good half hour, you know, about what, what his plans were with, you know, with what he was 
selling if he was having trouble making you know making a decision on which you know on something to, that he made wanted to hang on to more than anything else that that sort of thing talked about his rookie card too which was kind of fun um the the upper deck one um and, and it's funny because last time i was at the classic off offices i think it was the last time or the time before that um there was still ed's uh miss pac-man machine sitting there, <laughs> sitting there in the lobby like i think it was going in in another auction or something at that point but it was it was just funny to see it's like oh ed liked pac-man <laughs> There you they go. are humans after all. Wow. Yes, exactly. Weird. It's, it's, um, what, you know what? It's, I always liked signing goalies to autograph deals though. Um, because they're nuts. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, yes and no. <laughs> yes and no. Um, oh, sweet, a couple goalies. I know they're going to be interesting characters. I love yeah. to sign these guys. Well, Gilles Graton, um, was a guy I signed at some point. I don't know if you know the stories behind his, his career Wasn't and with, like, with the cool mask. Yeah, with with the tiger mask. Yeah. Yes, that guy. Well, yeah, lion yeah. mask, lion mask. Everybody calls it tiger, but it's yeah. Um, Gary Simmons was a guy I signed. Uh, he had the cobra mask. Gary Bromley, who had the skull mask. Um, legendary. Yeah, like just some guys who had legendary masks, and you know it. it but it, you know, I remember tracking down um, one of the e-bug goalies one time, uh, Tom Fenton. You know, he was in a between the price release. Um, I think the, one of the goalies I take the most pride in getting, though, was Gary Innes, who most people don't really know about. Um, he played for the Penguins in the 70s. He was, um, you know, fairly decent. Played for the Flyers, too, Capitals, and the uh, Indianapolis Racers in the WHA. And he became a teacher after after his hockey career, because he had gone to Concordia in Montreal, um, you know, before even becoming an NHL player. So with Gary Innes, he was notorious for not signing through the mail autographs. Like people would send him stuff and he just, you know, either get sent back, disappear, whatever. Um, and he, he wouldn't even sign for his students, you know, unless there was a really good reason for him to sign. So he was I so called protective him up. of his autograph. Yeah. Very protective. So with, with, um, I was able to track him down. Um, and I had heard this story about how this um, one of his students was, um, was a, ha had some sort of lump issue and talked to him and he basically encouraged them to go get tested and it basically saved the kid's life, right? So I mentioned that story to him, you know, saying, you know, how much, because I respect, like, so much respect for, for doing that for somebody, right? And um, it, it you know, it, it was part of, you know, what convinced him to, to do the project. And, um, you know, to, to this day, it's like, and he passed away, I think, within the past year. But he was just, you know, that was, to me, was one of those feather in your cap kind of guys. Like, you know, all right, it's like, it's like, you know, 80% of the people who open this pack of cards and get him aren't going to know who he is. But maybe they'll flip over the back of the card and, you know, or maybe do a little research and figure out who the guy is and what he meant and so. for like for the autograph collectors out there i think just owning a card with his autograph for those guys it might mean that much more you know because mm -hmm. like wow like I, I might be chasing this specific set or just collecting penguins autographs or whatever and yeah. this guy is really hard to get and mm -hmm. they might know of that card that you're speaking of yeah. and they really want to track it down because his autograph obviously is 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 very hard to find yeah. if you find one at all so that might be like kind of a cool little card to track down for, you know, the autograph guys out there, yeah. even though he might not be that well known. He's a big mm -hmm. chase card. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's, you know, there's some guys who would have been amazing to get like a, like a Don Simmons, who was a notorious non-signer. Um, there's a great story that, that Ken Whitmell told me about when they were doing the 93, 94 Parkhurst uh, missing link set for the 56, 57 design, the first one they did. And, Every player was basically ag agreeing, you know, kind of as a group, okay, we're going to get paid this and da, 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 da. Well, Simmons tried to hold up the process because Simmons had been, you know, a goalie for the Bruins 56 57. The other goalie, well, I'll get to it in a second. So um, basically, they, it got to the point with Simmons where he was just not going to do it. Like there was no way he was going to do it for the amount of money that they had budgeted. Like it just wasn't going to happen. So 
And Simmons is like, well, what are you going to do? Like, you know, this is your product. Like I played that season. I need to be there. And I think Ken said to him, well, you know who the other goalie was who played in Boston that year? Yeah. Terry Sawchuk. I think we're good. And that was it. <laughs> that was it. Like, to me, it's like, that's, that's an amazing way to deal with that. I mean, there were guys I tried to sign like John, like John Tonelli, I tried to sign and it just, I really wanted it to happen because I know how much he means to collectors of that, you know, from that generation who, you know, enjoyed watching him. And it was just like, it was just a no go. Like it just wasn't going to happen. Joey Juno, just a no go. Like it was just, it happens. Like, you know, like the, people have their reasons for not signing Jim Corn, who I referred to earlier from my first pack of hockey cards. I basically had about a, a 15 second conversation with him and that was it. He just was not going to do it. And that, that to me was probably the one that's st- one of the ones that stung the most because <laughs> he was going to be one of those ones for um, enforcers. And um, with that, cause, I mean, he was a tough guy, right? And would have been, would have been a great addition to the product and yeah, just didn't want to do it. There were a couple guys who didn't want to get involved in enforcers either. And, you know, there's all sorts of, crazy stories revolving around that product. And uh, if you open your Google, you'll see some interesting public reaction at the time and some interesting uh, perspective from a certain player who I shall not name, who, <laughs> um, who you will see in those reports and who would basically, when I signed him to the deal, had no problem talking about, you know, fighting in hockey, but then got on his high horse, right, you know, right, once, right. He, once he saw the design. Well, and here, here's something people won't know. Players don't have input on designs. <laughs> it's, it's, you know, it's not in their contracts. You know, what like, about um, like their likeness? Like I know Austin Matthews, like obviously a, a rare case mm-hmm. and probably McDavid too, but um, they have um, like their likeness is so important like to their camp. So, I mean, mm-hmm. as far as the finished product, as far as like that image selected on the card, like, have you ever run into a case where it's like a player really wanted to know what the card looked like before they really approved it? Like, I know they only have some, um, like but. There were a couple of cases, um, high pro- higher profile cases mm-hmm, mm-hmm. within the game. Like I can't speak to current right. active players, right? Um, you know, cause that's not, not my department. No, that's fine. You know, not my circus, not my monkeys. And there were about three or four guys under contract who had approval on what photos we could use. Basically, it's like, here's a, we would, you know, send, a, a, you know, the images, here's the images what, that we want to use on your cards, you know, and they'd say yay or nay, right? And, you know, and then at that point further, we could use, you know, them at any, any, any those images at any point. But it was just a matter of they had to be approved probably can't name names on it, but there, there were just only three of them. Um, in terms of players, you know, that were, you know, wanted to see images first of, of the card, you know, I, I get generally, you know, would kind of give them the blanket speech about how, well, you know, we're paying you for use your image on the cards. We don't give you control over the, the design or anything like that. And, and, you know, granted, never any issue when it was asked. Um, the only two, pl- and it's funny that you mentioned that because we had to do, we did mock-ups for Juno and Tonelli at their request and still couldn't get a deal with them. With Juno, he actually questioned. Now, do you remember in on the 92, 93 cards of Juno and maybe some 93, 94s where he's wearing the um, the shield with the, with the black chin strap that, you know, after, I think he had a broken jaw or something like I that. Think so. Yeah. Um, so we, I thought, well, I'm going to use a shot where he's wearing that helmet because it looks really cool. And yeah, he didn't like it. So, it, it, and that's fine. That's fine, you know. But it's, it was just, you know, disappointing because, I mean, he was a 100-point guy. Tonelli, 100-point guy, four, four times Stanley Cup champ, you know, just underrated player even today in, in my books. But I don't think you'll ever see John Tonelli do an autograph project for anybody. As I, far I, as like autographs go, um, because you mentioned a, you know, a few times now that, that people might not sign for any given reason, but what would you say is the most common reason why some players would say no 
got autograph on cards? Um, probably because they don't need the money. <laughs> okay. No, that's yeah. Um, honestly, or, you know, or does it, or, but I mean, ultimately it's personal, right? Like it's, yeah, yeah it, could, it could be money or it could be the fact that, you know, it's a part of their life that are, they don't necessarily want to think about too much anymore. It's private. Like it's at home. Yeah. Like they don't want to be bothered. No, that's yeah. fair. Like look at Paul Korea. Right. I don't super think, I don't think, he, yeah, super private. I don't think he'll ever sign for a card company. He did when he played, but I mean, like, yes. as far as like post career. Post career, you're not, I don't think you're going to see it. Um, maybe like when he gets really old. Maybe. maybe. Um, but I, I see what you're saying. He's super private. I yeah. saw a documentary on him. I think Sportsnet did one on him. And after mm. he retired, he just didn't put on his skates yeah. like, at all. Like, he hasn't played hockey since, which is crazy. He just surfs out in California all day. What a life. Well, it, it seems like a, a pretty dar- darn good life, I gotta Not say. Bad, but eh? <laughs> but he, here's the thing: it's like, yeah, he's he's. I think he only signed for Be a Player Products. Yes, I think that's the only one. I could be yeah. wrong, but yes. Yeah, that's and it, and um, I although I do remember approaching his agent at one point. Was the agent I, like, okay, sure? And then Paul was like, no, nah. no, 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 no. It was just, or they just knew it, how it is. They just knew how it was. Mm-hmm. You know, it was just. Nope. Sorry. Yeah, and, and and you know, you kind of understood. I, mean, I respect it. Yeah, I, I I tried to sign George Armstrong uh, on a couple of occasions. I had conversations with George, um, you know, and yeah, he he, he just doesn't want to do it. You know, um, he's not authorizing anything out there. Let's let's just say that. Um, and well, n- obviously not because he's passed away, but during his lifetime, he wasn't authorizing anything. And we'll just leave that out there for people to read between the lines on. But in the, another one that came up, and it's funny because his, his autobiography just came out, um, Fred Sasakamus. And I, are, are you familiar with Fred? Oh, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Very um, much. Fred and I had a verbal agreement to do cards. And um, we sent him the cards. They, they had to go by post. They, they couldn't go by courier because he was very in a re- remote area of Saskatchewan had a fantastic probably like one or two hour conversation with him like it was just amazing to talk to the man because you know what he means you know culturally what he means you know to the game you know just and just was a very very nice person and he he did the hold up because he didn't like what was being offered and I, i i tried to kind of broker you know some some level of you know, agreement between him and Brian, but it, it, it just, you know, didn't come to fruition. And to me, that, that's, it's a big regret on my end that it, it didn't happen. So the cards were printed. They were just never signed, you know, and they, and they, they, they didn't make it out into packs or anything like that. But yeah, it, it's just like, to me, that would have been a card, like one of those cards that's like, yeah, I, I'm pretty proud to have made that card. Um, I got close, but yeah. More than I can say. So anyway, I think Eric has a big question in regards to autographs. Yeah, I sure do. So, you know, of course, we've been talking a lot about autographs. And, and one thing that I know we wanted to talk about with you, um, you know, like we've kind of gone through, you, you have that historian kind of outlook on, on the hobby and a lot of things in general, mm-hmm. um, you know, and tying that into autographs. Uh, I know you wanted to share with us a little bit about the story of why at the beginning of his career, Sidney Crosby would only sign individually. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> okay, so as, as we've seen kind of talk, talked about on, on boards and on, on Twitter and that sort of thing recently is that, you know, there's a definite absence of dual sign cards featuring Sidney Crosby from the early portion of his career. I, I mean, the reason f- for that at the time, because I mean, in the game had him under contract for the 0506 season. You know, how that happened, I, I t- tip my hat to Brian on that one. But um, it was part of the, the approval process on Crosby cards at the time is they all had to be run through uh, his agent and Troy Crosby. So stage dad. His kinda, dad, right? Yeah. Yeah, in effect, a little bit. Um, it was the first and one of the few times I've ever had any criticism on card backs. Like they picked them apart because it was that, um, 
the 30 card set that was produced or 25 card set that was just, you know, a kind of a career chronology and that sort of thing. Um, if, if you remember when he was in junior, he did that lacrosse style goal. Yeah. And he, they, I wrote a beautiful card back about it. I, you know, it was just a piece of art and then they rejected it full out. Just no, nope, not doing it, that. No, it killed me. I'm just like, so I, I had basically like they, they chewed that thing apart so much that I, I, I'm just like, okay, go back to square one. I'm going to put this here, this here, this here. Like I had to do a little bit of uh, shuffling around, you know, and create a couple, like three or four new card back, new themes, um, which is whatever it, it happens. Um, it was infuriating to me at the time. Um, but what I quickly discovered was we couldn't do his autograph with anybody else. Like it was, you know, mandated basically either by the agency, which I don't think so much. I think it more fell under the Troy Crosby thing, but I think it was not to be rude or disrespectful to any other player. I think what, what it was, was it was more, they don't want to take away from somebody else. If you know what I mean? Like they don't want to take away somebody else's spotlight. I don't think I don't think there was anything malicious or ridiculous about it in a sense. Like but, making Crosby seem he was better than everybody, but you know, making yeah. Crosby seem like almost like too good. Yeah. For signing cards with other players. Like they didn't want it to come off like that. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Um, you know, it, <sighs> But it, it's funny because that one Upper Deck SPX card with yes um, with, with the labels. My theory on that one is, um, like, I totally forgot about that card when I tweeted about it. But, um, mm. like, my theory is with that card, I, I think Upper Deck at the time, um, and I, I don't want to speculate too much, but I think what, like, they thought, okay, it's sticker autos. We have them. We can put them wherever we want. Let's do this cool combo with Gretzky. Mm -hmm. You know, these autographs are already paid for. Like, we're good. And then Crosby's camp came back around and said, nah, even though they're stickers, you can't just go placing them like wherever yeah. you want. And then from then on, stickers or hard signed, it had to be no duels. And the only duel autographs they did do was with Crosby himself. And he signed the yeah. card twice, obviously. Mm -hmm. And so those cards, um, I don't think I've seen anyone say anything bad about those cards, but yeah. um, I always thought they were kind of cool. Uh, it was a little different. Um... You know, it, it to me it was just just different. Um, it was very different. Yeah, it was like I mean, but the player that can sign his card. Yeah, but then again, I'm the guy who who was sitting, you know, in my office and and brought, um, this is just after we're developing the first superlative release, um, and then Brian comes into my office with a design with no photo on it, and I'm thinking this isn't gonna fly. <laughs> and then look at for years how many cards have got, that come out there. And people bought even without the photos. You know, to me as a collector, I was just like, what? <laughs> but here, here, there we were. And, and it worked, um, you know, for a time. I, I don't know, you know, how collectors generally feel about that kind of stuff now. Um, I mean, it's still out there, but I, I just. It's hit or miss. It's hit or miss. Um, I, but I think when we did it, you know, between, tw you know, 20, 2007 and 2014 we at least tried to draw themes together we didn't um it wasn't so hodgepodge as it kind of seems now you know i, I guess i'll just leave that at that but it was definitely a, a different time and it was kind of neat to see some of that kind of stuff and it's, it's not like upper deck didn't do it too it's not like you know other manufacturers didn't do it too um you know it, it just maybe not as much as in the game did at the time so and oh, another project I, I really did love out of the game was the Famous Fabrics uh, hockey sets. I, I don't know if you recall that one, you know, where it was all one of one cut signatures. And, you know, I was basically the one going through mountains and mountains and mountains of cuts. Because um, a lot of the, some of the cuts from that actually came from signed contracts, believe it or not. I've, that, I've uh, seen something like that. It's, it's really cool. I forget who it was. I want to say like, Maurice Richard or something and it was like part yeah. of his contract or part of his 
check off of his contract, something weird like that. It was oh, so yeah, weird. there were definitely uh, check cuts. Uh, yeah, all the time. those are cool. But this was like in the game contracts, like contracts I would have signed a player to. Mm, player like, contract, here I am cutting yeah. out the signature to, put, to have them embedded to a card. That's awesome. But I mean, the, 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 the contract had been long over at that point, whatever. Like, it was not, not a huge deal. But it was definitely one of those things. Like, you know, I spent a lot of time, a lot, I, I made a lot of trips up to Toronto for, for, for you know, making that, making that set. And um, that and um, History of Hockey one with the, uh, with the slap, with the, with the slap cards inside. That was really fun. That, that was a really fun, fun one. Um, one of the few cards I kept was um, an, uh, one of the uh, in the game vault versions of the Owen Nolan um, '97 All Star oh, yeah. Game, which actually it where works, he points, right? Where he points, yeah, yeah. Because um, that's one of my all time favorite hockey moments, and I actually signed Owen to, to deals, which was all was well, it's always fun, right? And the the card has a piece, you know, it's a, it's it's a Mike James artwork, I believe, I'm like ninety nine percent sure on that, and there's. A, a swatch of a, of the jersey Nolan's jersey from that game in that card. So to me that that was a keeper. That was, you know, it w- wasn't hard to to say no to, you know, keeping that little piece of card for. It's always nice when you can uh like I have a couple cards like that. It's hard now obviously because there's so many photos, there's so many pieces of memorabilia out there, different sets of jerseys, things like that. But it's always cool when you can like match the memorabilia piece you know, to a specific game and that game is on the card. It's just, it's just like next level stuff. And it's just so cool. It really is. Oh, um, it's amazing. I, uh, I did a nice blog series of blog posts um, with Upper Deck last year um, where people were selecting their top three, their top base cards of all time. Um, from the flag, flagship series uh, base cards of all time. And um, I, I did like the, the first initial list of 20 and, um, and then the next list of 10. But, I, but for each card, it's like, I would try to look up who the photographer was and you know, when the shot was taken. And I, and I put that into the article. So and, you know, I hope um, you know, people that read, read those, those old blog posts you know, will uh, maybe appreciate my efforts. I think a lot of people would appreciate that. I mean, I can't even count how many times I've heard it would be nice if there was some sort of record of of this photograph about like mm-hmm. when this game was or when this mm-hmm. memorabilia piece was was kind of used like some yeah. sort of record of, of something you know yeah. when it comes to cards instead of these blanket statements so yeah. it's cool to see those things well, it's 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 funny that you mentioned that because um like over the years like with classical peachy cards like from yeah you know, kind of like 75 76 onward um, you can gen- you can sometimes figure out when the um, photo was taken because you know you can tell if it was either in Washington or if it was in Boston, um, and then you figure out well when was that player there that year, um, and that and that sort of thing. And it and to me that's that's a lot of fun. Like it, it's it's historical research. It's something I've done on a casual basis because I'm just a friggin' nerd, right? So, um, but I was the first one to report, I believe. Um, when I did, when I co-authored the book, um, got him, got him, need him the, uh, top 100 trading cards of all time, which is now a decade old. <laughs> I was so, going to uh, mention it. Like we're yeah. going to talk about it a little bit, but yeah. Yeah. But, um, the, in the, in the Gretz, the, in the section about the Gretzky rookie, um, I talked to the original photographer, Steve Babineau, who's a friend of mine. He, Babs has been shooting the Bruins since like 72, 73. Um, and he was there shooting the Gretzky rookie card photo in Springfield, Massachusetts. Springfield was where the New England Whalers were playing at the time because the, they were repairing the roof on the Hartford Civic Center. So, you know, Gretzky's actually playing that game against Gordie Howe, which is fantastic. And I believe that, uh, I think Babs said that was taken in the warmups as well. So for me, you know, every card has a story and, um, you know, it's just sometimes it's easier to, it's fun, easy to discover when things were taken. And it helps to know somebody like Babs who, you know, shot so much for Tops and OPG and Pro Set and uh, Upper Deck and in the game. And he shot for everybody. Um, he shot for Fleer too. Uh, he did the uh, Bill Ripken uh, photo, the infamous uh, bat. Um, and then um, Jerry Walker was the guy who shot out of... Um, Washington so 
you know, because they had this nice strobe set up there. So the, uh, the, the photos always look so good on those cards. And then also um, Bruce Bennett did a few shots for Tops and OPGs over the years too. And I, I, I keep in touch with Bruce as well. You know, you see him every year in the Stanley Cup final out there with his messy white hair taking pictures. So, you know, he's still there. He's still got it. That's awesome. Um, you've kind of almost done this a little bit already, but um, is there an obscure hockey card factor too that you know that most collectors don't? Oh my goodness. Um, Just pick one. The first one that comes to your mind. Oh, I know there's too many. Oh my God. All right. Um, well, actually it, it ties into something I did, um, but not, you know, but long before I was born, <laughs> but I'll explain. Okay. So for years um, leading up to the early 2000s, the, the hobby believed that the worldwide gum set from the, the late thirties was a 1936-37 release. Here's the thing. Nobody took the time to read the backs of the cards. So when I was writing, doing my slam collectibles thing, I basically, you know, I, w- I went to the expo. I got the last card in the set with, with Bill Stewart, who was um, the coach of the Blackhawks. He was a referee. He was a baseball major league umpire. Uh, his son, his grandson, Paul Stewart, was a referee and NHL player. So Bill Stewart on the back talks about him joining the Blackhawks as coach. Well, he, he joined them at the beginning of the 37-38 season. So why is this set, you know, being called a 36-37? So um, on eBay, I went on eBay and somebody was selling each card from the set individually. It was very serendipitous. So I'm, I'm looking on all the backs and I'm, and I'm reading them. And I'm thinking, you know, this has got to be 37-38. There's no no debate here, especially when I look at Howie Morenza's card and it refers to him as having passed away. <laughs> so nobody for 60 plus years took the time to figure this out. So I, um, I, met, I messaged the people at Beckett at the time. They reluctantly made the change. PSA took forever to acknowledge the change, but it's one thing that you know, it's an obscure hockey card thing, very obscure. But you know, I, 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 I'm glad I could take a little credit for that one. You made it happen. Yes. But <laughs> um, another, oh, another cool hockey card fact. They're just pieces of cardboard, man. Just pieces of cardboard, with pretty pictures. Let's you know, let's not overthink them. Let's just enjoy them. That's very well said. Yeah. Uh, speaking of hockey cards, obviously, is there this is a hockey card podcast? Um, you did mention it earlier, um, your book, Got Him, Got Him, Need Him. Um, you can definitely plug it as much as you want here. <laughs> to just, it's all good. Um, what was it like to write a book about cards? Like, obviously, you've written a lot about cards, but to get that experience to write a book must have been, you know, next level. And just to go through that and how that was seeing that process from beginning to end. Well, it's kind of interesting because um, my co author on that, uh, John Waldman, who had known for, for a few years at that point um he had built a relationship with ecw press out of toronto and um john and i had always talked about doing some sort of book at some point um and we made the pitch and uh they were they were all over it um you know it was it took less than a year i think for us to from concept to final draft um because i think we were basically had kind of a, an oral agreement uh, around the time I got married. So that was late, uh, like October, September, October, 2009. And then John and I, in the, within the next few months had, uh, you know, hours of negotiating the list, uh, making cases for items. Um, and he, he's got, you know, a, a quirky approach to what's, what he likes in the hobby. Um, you know, I mean, we all do, we all have our, our, our quirks when it, when it comes to collecting. And, um, so there was definitely some, you know, heated, but good natured debating, um, you know, a lot of hours on, on the phone talk, talking about that because he is out of Winnipeg. And then it was more frustrating trying to get images for everything <laughs> that, that we needed. Um, but you know, there were collectors that were fantastic about it, dealers that were fantastic about it. Um, the design, the book, design of the book. I, I, I love like the, the, 
the cover paying tribute to like the 1970 tops baseball rapper, you know, and just the interior content. Um, we basically split up, you know, did kind of a 50 and 50. Um, so you could probably tell which uh, bios were mine and which bios were his, um, you know, at least to, a, a, you know, somebody who's used to either of ours work. Um, and then we would have received our sample copies, you know, like the, a physical copy in, you know, early 2011. And then we uh, unleashed it on the world in, in April of that year. And, uh, you know, it uh, sold some copies. <laughs> I don't know if it ever actually sold through. I, I, I couldn't tell you. It's all right. I mean, like anyone to get their name on a book is an amazing accomplishment in, in one mm. way or the other. Uh, I'm not sure what it's like in the world of writers. Like maybe everyone has a book, but to me, it's an amazing accomplishment. So, I mean, that is just awesome. Yeah. It, it's funny because my sister is, um, you know, she's a couple of years younger than me. Um, she's a teacher and um, she's started to write horror. Novels. Nice. Don't let any of the students read it. Yeah, pretty much. Um, actually, it's it's nothing to. Um, it's like a thriller. To, yeah. Well, it's kind nothing of. too gruesome at this point. Um, you know, I, I'm waiting for her to, to to you know embrace the gore. I guess I don't I don't know. Um, but you know, she regularly asks me for 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 opinions and critiques on things, which is which is really nice. Like she pre appreciates my opinion. Um, but I mean, you know, I did the second book. It um, it didn't meet my vision, if that makes any sense. Um, you know, there were a lot of cuts made to it. There were, um, you know, and cuts that people, of stuff that people would have wanted to see in the book, like st statistic rec statistical records and that sort of thing. Um, I know there had been plans for an expanded ebook, but, you know, I, I didn't nurture the best relationship with, with the publisher. And, um, you know, I haven't, done a book since um but you know i've probably written several books worth of stuff since then um you know counting cards counting articles counting whatever um but you know now dr jeffrey griffith and i um who collectors some collectors may know as being a very prominent collector of Gwen gretzky cards and also one of the nicest people you'll meet in the hobby um he and i are in the process of working out a deal with a publisher on a hockey card book, like a coffee table book. Um, tell us everything. Uh, well, there's not a lot to tell at this point. Okay, well, um, that's true. That's true. No, keep yeah. it a secret. If yeah. there's any sort of titles or where to expect the book, let our listeners know. Um, <laughs> you want to get a little bit under wraps. Um, it, it's very under wraps at this point. Yeah, no, but, that's fine. Um, I can tell you that... Um, you know, I, I've done, done a few interviews with, with people for it that, um, you know, a couple celebrities that collected um, hockey cards, um, one of which is doing the forward. And let's just say he's um, a pro wrestling legend. Let's just leave it at that. All right. All right. <laughs> all we'll right. Definitely. We'll keep the mystery there for now. Yeah. Sure you're going to promote yourself eventually. That's totally no problem. Well, but yeah. And um. You did mention back to cards for a minute, yep. <laughs> <laughs> but um, you did mention earlier that you are in the process of selling off the majority of, of your collection, um, obviously in this crazy market. Um, if you want to just let our listeners know where you can find some of those, uh, those listings. Yeah. And, well, uh, I don't, I, I don't, I don't want to sound like too much of a shill, but yes, no, no, so, no, please, no, please bid. Um, bid on all my cards. Yeah, on well, I, I've got, um, um, a few dozen lots um, in the current classic auctions event, and um, one of which uh, I don't want to necessarily. What can I tip my hat on? <laughs> um, there's a very big lot of autograph cards in there. Let's just say that a couple large lots of certified autograph cards. Um, you know, there's um, you know a few sets. You know from and partial sets from like 51, 52 onward. There's some nice pre-war in there, um, you know, but with anything, you know, it, 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 the decision to sell with Classic was a no-brainer for me. Um, you know, they're, they're Canada's top auction house when it comes to hockey uh, and sports collectibles. Um, you know, they, they, they've treated me so well over the years. Um, you know, I've 
you know, spent time at their offices in Montreal, you know, helping, you know, develop copy for their catalogs and, and that sort of thing. Um, it wasn't a hard decision to, uh, pardon me, it wasn't as hard a decision to make as I thought it would be to part with, with so much. Um, when you spend nearly 40 years of your life in a hobby and you, you just accumulate and accumulate and accumulate and you know, it's things mean something to you, but at the same time, it's like, it's sitting in a box in the side closet. It's, um, you know, you know, it's there. There's a certain comfort level in having it there, but then you're like, okay, well, you know, you know, they're, they're there, but it's either, you know, I should at least either keep collecting these sets or, or keep collecting these types of cards, like keep it going or maybe get rid of it. Because unless I sort of display it some way or another, mm -hmm. um, if that's even wise, yeah, it's gonna be sitting there. So I totally get what you mean, mm -hmm. kind of downsizing that collection to so that you can fully enjoy what you have. Because no doubt, mm -hmm. I mean, you can't sell everything because there's no. too many common stuff that you just can't get rid of. So it's like I might as well just sell the stuff that has some value, especially in this market, and mm -hmm. then just really enjoy the ones that you do have. I think yeah, be great. Yeah. Now, and it, what, what it also is too, is like, you know, ultimately as collectors, we're, we're merely custodians for these items. At some point we buy them from somebody. At some point they end up with somebody else, you know, unless they're buried with, with us, you know, the, the odds are there, there's a, there's this transferal of the, of an, of the experience. It's, it's this transferal of, you know, and this is a concept I got from, um, from uh, Pat Mastroianni um, who, played Joey Jeremiah on Degrassi back in the day um, and he was who was a collector and we were talking one time about the the concept of transference how somebody gets a collectible there's a there's already a story behind that collectible there's a you know it could be a beat up Gordie Howe from 1958 well there's a story obviously about how some kid dropped it in a puddle or whatever and now it's in your collection but you're going to take care of that card for the next you know 30 years and then at some point you know gordy's going to go move on somewhere else you know so it creates a new experience everywhere it goes but it's but it still transfers some of that feeling along the way yeah like some of those old like cards especially the pre-war stuff man like i have one pre-war card mm -hmm. and i'm just sitting there like man what happened to this card it, it like it just it's so cool like the the history of who owned this card mm -hmm. and, and how many hands it changed is so cool to me so i mean i totally get that like yeah. even some of those beat up gretzky's or beat up any rookie card yeah. it's kind of like some people say like oh like why would you want that um but i mean like even those crumpled up cards have a story and that's just so mm -hmm. cool yeah and and to me it's um you know it was also what i loved about vintage cards too was getting them signed like getting a, a nice the guy's rookie card signed that to me was always such a great experience and you know it's funny because i'd get a car i'd get a rookie card signed and then it would you know i'd never end up replacing it <laughs> in, in my regular set so with the, the sets i i have up on classic you might be able to easily, easily spot them because they're the ones with the autograph cards in, in them um you know, so it's like, oh, well, yeah, that's a nice 58-59 set. Oh, wait, there's a signed Bobby Hall rookie card in there. It's like, well, I didn't get a chance to replace it. So, you know, it's uh, th there's definitely some... I know that the joy I experienced collecting all this stuff, it's going to end up hopefully creating joy for somebody else. And that's, that's a really good feeling. I can't deny that. Yeah, absolutely. That's a really cool... Um just kind of an outlook to have, you know, on cards and any collectible, you know, that, you know, it's just ours for right now. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and that concept, you know, like Aaron was saying, you know, what has this pre-war card, you know, gone through yep. and who's owned it? Um, I do have a few cards from around that era. And the most notable one being, I, I do have a George Vesna rookie card mm -hmm. and I actually bought that from AJ Vesna himself. So pretty, yeah, that's pretty, pretty cool. cool little, tie in there for sure Definitely. so i think that's really all the questions we have is there <laughs> anything else that you would want to add steven um well i think what it what i'd like to add is you know i you know if anybody's thinking you know at this point you know 
as a veteran collector, if, the, if you have to make that decision, it's like, am I going to sell or am I going to keep this? You know, and, am I, and if I sell it, am I going to regret it? The odds are, it's like, you may have mild regrets, but at the same time, it's like, it's, it's not as painful in this, as an experience as it needs to be. You know, and the, and, the, and the fact is, is even if you sell, you can still enjoy the hobby and you can still enjoy certain aspects of it. Like one of, one of my favorite things about collecting and about, you know, my experiences over the years and going to shows and online and all that sort of thing is that the friendships I've built with people. That's, you know, to me, that means so much more than just a piece of cardboard sometimes. You know, it's the, you know, and we may not always agree on, on issues and we may not always see eye to eye on, you know, whether it's politics, whether it's, you know, religion, whether it's this or whether that's that, you know, but, you know, at least we all have that common bond of collecting, you know, and, it, and it's a collecting family and, you know, it's just a very large one and a very dysfunctional one. Very true. That is yeah. very, very true. Well, um, Stephen, we just want to thank you so much for your time. This was a lot of fun and oh, yeah. I'm glad that, that you were able to come on and join us. Anytime. And I, and I hope we can do it again. Um, you know, it's, uh, you know, it's a, never, never a big deal to talk about vintage hockey cards or modern hockey cards or what have you. It's, you know, it's, it's what we love and, you know, it, it's sharing the history and sharing just the thing that brings us all together. I agree. Absolutely. Um, thanks for coming on here. Like when you answered my tweet about the Crosby being like, Hey, you know, maybe I can come and talk about that on your podcast. I was like, Oh man, you know, like, thanks for noticing it exists. Like that's well, all I was thinking. Well, it's one thing I've learned, you know, over the past, you know, 20 plus years of, of following the hobby online, you know, going back to like message boards, going back to whatever. Um, it's keeping an eye on what everybody's doing. You know, it's, um, there's always an opportunity to help somebody. There's always an opportunity to, to share your knowledge. And, it, you know, it, in the end, it, hopefully it just makes the hobby a better place to be. Couldn't have said it better myself. That's like the quote of the night, I think. <laughs> well, if anything, I'm quotable. <laughs> no, you're, you gave so much information. I love the Crosby story because it's so interesting to me, but also it started this whole getting you on the podcast thing. So the Crosby story for me was amazing, but your mm. whole history in the hobby is just truly one of a kind. Um, Thank you. And just, yeah, no, I, I appreciate what you've done in the past. I appreciate what you do now. And um, yeah, no, thank you so much for coming on. And yeah, uh, yeah I'm sure we'll definitely have you on as a guest uh in the future for sure it would be my pleasure awesome yep so that was uh steven la rush obviously he has a wealth of knowledge when it comes to the hobby he just gave us so much there which was amazing uh thank you so much for everyone for listening just to let you guys know we do have a contest we are um giving away a lot of our hits from our um upper deck breaks that you saw for series two and for black diamond. So we do have a contest going on uh, on Twitter and you can find us at center ice CC for that. And uh, we're just doing a quick little retweet slash comment contest. So that's, that's fine. Just quick and easy. So if you want to win some cards, definitely check that out on Twitter. Yeah. So I think that should pretty much wrap it up. A little bit longer of an episode, but with as much experience as Stephen has in this hobby and, you know, being on the inside in so many different ways, you know, I mean, we've had people on that have been on the inside, you know, of a company or whatever, but I mean, he's been on the inside of, you know, as many different things as you can think of. Two so, companies, Beckett, some, some, some older things, um, side projects with Upper Deck, just collecting experience in general, just amazing. Yeah, so definitely worth the time for sure um you know and i mean we we could go on for hours and hours and hours with him i mean there's just so much that you know he can share about and that he's knowledgeable about so um you know definitely grateful for his time and and hearing what he had to share with us uh during this episode so as always please be sure to follow us on social media we can be found on facebook instagram and youtube at center ice cardcast and on twitter like aaron said at center ice cc Please also be sure to subscribe to the show on your podcast platform of choice to make sure you never miss a future episode. Until next time on Center Ice Cardcast, keep collecting those hockey cards.